We're good? All righty. Um, we're going to get started. All right, so I wanted to start off by saying I'm really, really excited to be here. First DerbyCon for me. I don't know how many of you guys first DerbyCon. Yeah, good times. Excellent. So, um, yeah, let's get into this. Uh, in essence, the talk is about DDoS. Um, so we're going to be talking about some new vectors, uh, some exploitation type stuff. Um, and it's going to cover a wide range of things. Uh, and it's focused on really uh, the penetration tester and really being able to demonstrate the risks um, and testing uh, in DDoS. So let's get into this. Uh, the first thing, um, we need permission before we do any sort of DDoS, right? This is a really critical element. So uh, thank you for taking notice of this notice here. Um, feel free to uh, take a look. Um, all righty. So the, uh, the talk, the agenda, we're going to start off by talking about sort of some industry trends, set the stage for the rest of the talk, and then from there we're going to go into some details about specific vectors that we've found to be successful, as well as to sort of expand the current methodology and toolkits to be more distributed in nature, because that's really where we found some limitations in existing uh, toolkits capabilities, is on making this stuff fully distributed, as well as um, putting it together so that you can you can leverage it in, in a real engagement. So first off, who am I? Um, so my name is Josh Abraham, also known as uh, Jabra, from many of you guys who know. Um, I run the services team at a company out of Austin, Texas called Praetorian. Uh, we do application uh, penetration testing, network penetration testing for many Fortune 5000, Fortune 1000 organizations pretty much across the board. Um, also do some high techs and financials. Uh, I've done a lot of presentations at a lot of different conferences, Black Hat, DEF CON, um, pretty much everything around the board. Um, I do a lot of coding in Perl, so if you guys are Perl guys, let me know, um, as well as Ruby, which you guys will see in this talk. Um, so we're not really here to talk about that. What we're really here to talk about is the landscape today and where we see things going. Currently, what we're seeing is a lot of clients will come to us and say, we're having problems, we want to test our security, and we're focusing in on the confidentiality or the integrity of the data. This is really what we see a lot. We see this every day, all the time. People are not really focused on the availability testing, right? Maybe they're, maybe they're doing it before they get it to us, or they're just not asking for it. Um, but what we're seeing really is that there's not a lot of tools out there that help clients understand what would it be to do a test that is going to test your organization from you know, the highs to the lows across the board in terms of DDoS. So it's sort of like an ad hoc process. So we put together a methodology for everybody to, to make this a little bit easier. So starting out, uh, one of the pieces that we actually looked at initially was a vulnerability that we actually ran into in a pen test. And this was a PHP vulnerability which gave remote code execution, right? We see this all the time. Um, but why this is actually interesting was this actually was leveraged in the wild to do a distributed denial of service, right? And even though it's a vulnerability from um, several years ago, it's still being utilized in the wild today, 2013, 2014. Like this is relevant and still being used. So it's PHP vuln, but you know, it gives you code execution. Uh, we all know about the, uh, the bash. Uh, bugs that have been uh, been released recently, so it sort of falls into the same bucket. If you can get code execution, you know, I don't, you know, whatever, what do you use that code execution to do, right? And what we're seeing is they're going to use it for uh, DDoS. Very, very prevalent. So a quick proof of concept with curl um, and bash put together um, looked like this. Not very exciting or fancy. Um, and then converted it over to a Metasploit module. Um, and again, all of this code is already online, and you guys can go and read about the blog post for you know, how you could create um, a similar vulnerability or you know, demonstrated the exploit. Um, so vulnerabilities are existing. They're being utilized to perform DOS. Um, and what are we seeing in terms of metrics for, for denial of service? So here are some of the metrics out of a recent DDoS-based report. So we have an uptick in certain types of based vulnerabilities. UDP floods are way up, right, 300 um, gigabits per second. So this is really where people are going for the high bandwidth, right? And we're going to talk about how that actually is conducted um, in the next section. Um, but an interesting trend here is that there's been a significant increase in the reflection-based attacks, right? And what that is is really we're going to go into it in, in great depth. But for now, it's just 
um, you know, a not a, a indirect communication to your you know target system, um, and it's going to be using uh, NDP in this particular example. So let's talk about some different types of threats. Um, so you could just have like an, a traditional flood of bandwidth, right? We're going to just flood the pipes and just you know saturate all the network connections and just you know lock them down that way. Um, that's very unsophisticated, um, but it works, right? It, it works and you know, that, that's one route. Um, the problem is it requires you to have bigger pipes than the target, right? And not everybody has, you know, a 100 gigabit connection just sitting there, you know, if you did, like, let me know, that'd be great. <laughs> um, what, what more often happens is you take a look at the application and really break down that code base to say, let's attack the application as it lives and try to see if there are some weaknesses um, and interact with this application in a unique way um, and if we can bring it to its knees, not needing all of that bandwidth, it could be a cheaper solution. Uh, there are a lot of other different types of attacks here, um, but in essence, you know, the summary of all of these is that um, any different piece, um, so whether it's your upstream provider that we want to attack, and that affects your availability, or maybe you have different geographic locations, and I just bring you down in one, that's, you know, that, that could be what I'm trying to achieve. Um, there's a lot of different ways we can actually conduct a DOS. So this really just goes back to your threat model. Possibilities for attack, there's a lot of different layers here to go after, um, and it really just depends on, you know, what do you have in terms of capabilities. And later on in the talk, what we have is, we've actually compiled a menu. So based on your resources, you can say, all right, well, I'm going to attack them in this particular way, and we're gonna map it back here. Um, so really the summary from that is the high bandwidth attacks are not as sophisticated, but they do require the resource. The application layer attacks, way more sophisticated, um, moderate to high sophistication, um, but you, know, you do need you know, a little bit more reconnaissance. Sometimes you even need authentication to the application, which you may or may not have. Um, and both are really effective, um, but in theory, if you have DDoS-based protection controls, they might mitigate some of your attacks. But just some things to keep in mind here. So now what we're gonna do is shift our focus towards um, really diving into these reflection-based attacks. So what this is, is, um, so me, I'm a bad guy on the internet, I scan the internet, I try to identify vulnerable systems, and then I'm going to use those vulnerable systems to attack the target that I'm trying to affect. So what does this look like here? So the bad guy um, is using his laptop, he identifies a exposed service, and he basically does a spoof of the source IP address, and it says, hey, NTP service, Yes, I am this guy over here, and the response to this UDP request will go to the victim, right? And so the attacker does a little bit of work, he sends a very small request, and the response is huge, right? Which in essence gives us the DOS. And if we do this a long, long, a, a large number of times, and we're gonna use, you know, ideally UDP here, um, because it will give us, you know, the ability to just send packets on the wire and just not care about the response, it just floods the system. Um, and it really requires a couple of things. One, you need the vulnerable system or service to be exposed, right? And you have a lot of different services. NTP is one example. And then you also need the capability to spoof your IP address and to have it reach the target. So how does, how does this work um, for us as pen testers and how would this really work in the real world? Um, the problem is for a pen tester to be able to spoof an IP address and use vulnerable systems on the internet, it doesn't really fly with legal. Right? They probably will not approve this if I go to them and say, hey guys, we wanna use vulnerable systems on the internet to DOS client X. Yeah, they're not gonna to be too happy with me. Uh, the boss is not gonna approve that. He's, he's definitely not gonna look, look at that and be like, yeah. Um, so instead what we're gonna do is we're gonna use a couple of other approaches to really help clients mitigate this particular threat. Um, the best approach that I've found with clients is to really just walk them through um, talking about the different threat vectors here. And really just pointing out the fact that, look, um, we need to understand what your capabilities are for your upstream providers. If you're using, you know, content distribution networks, what are those? Uh, and what are the controls in place to mitigate um, a flood of this type of scale? Because if you saw 300 gigabits per second hitting your network, you're going to get cut off there. And, you know, it's just as easy. Um, so this is, this is how we would actually do it. Um, it would be more of a discussion-based approach rather than actually implementing um, the, the reflection-based attack using vulnerable systems on the internet. 
So to actually sort of illustrate this, we have a lot of different services that we could use. We could use NTP, uh, we could use DNS, as we had you know, mentioned. Um, there are some other services. One of the really cool ones that we found um, is, is this thing called uh, Chargen, char right? And this is basically a service. Um, just a quick uh, question. Does anybody know what, what port Chargen runs on? I heard somebody say it. Somebody said it. All right, well, one person said it. To be honest, it's like, it's a really antique Care, uh, service, right? So you basically you send it, you know, an A, and then it responds with a whole ton of data, right? This is like ideal for doing a DOS because it's all UDP and you're just, you know, just sending characters on the wire and it just floods the response, right? So this is like perfect. So the amplification is really huge here, right? 359 uh, as an amplification rating. NTP is the most, uh, the most, like 557, um, and just sort of just the breakdown of, of what's going on here. Um, so we compiled a little uh, chart here, basically show um, the metrics and the numbers. So if you were to choose a specific service, which ones would you go for? Um, and again, if we have systems on the internet, we can just scan for these blindly and just use them if we wanted to. Um, the metrics are all coming from CERT and NIST, so definitely reputable sources. And then what we can do is we can just map these back to something like Shodan to figure out like how many systems are vulnerable. And then if we were to utilize this, this is what the impact would be. Um, so pretty useful here. Um, one of the funny ones, if you look down at the bottom, the Quake protocol. Like, I remember Quake. I mean, everybody played like the old school games like, you know, Doom, Duke Nukem, all that stuff. Quake service, um, you know, kind of random, but uh, definitely still, still out there. You know, people are still using it. So NTP, right? Um, how do we scan for this? This is a interesting use case where Basically, what you do is you, you talk to the service that's exposed and you say, you know, tell me about the systems that you've connected to recently. And it basically just spits back a list of the, all of these different clients. And so what you can do is you can just use Nmap to do a quick query and you'll get a flood back of here are all the services or systems that I know about. And then where, where this actually got a little bit more interesting is I was actually looking and monitoring the Nmap or the, um, the Metasploit um, developers list. And one day I did an update and uh, John Hart, he had actually found a ton of different NTP based uh, vulnerabilities where um, you can use you know, this particular same vector with a lot of different other variants to get increased amplification. So kudos to John for that. So what we did was we took this particular vector and we basically had weaponized it already uh, in Metasploit, right? So he checked in the code, which would allow you to identify these different types of vulnerabilities um, using a uh, distributed based attack. Um, the problem was there was one limiting factor, um, which was in the code. It didn't actually allow spoofing, right? And spoofing is the most important vector for when you want to do an amplification, right? I want to say I am, you know, Google's IP and send it to the target and then it amplifies and then it does the spoof. Um, so this is what it looks like. So I, I took all of the different modules in Metasploit and modified uh, everything to basically support spoofing. And it really wasn't that long um, because it was just a, a quick change to uh, one of the, uh, the mixins. So all you need to do is just set the, uh, the source IP um, to be, you know, this is the system that we want to go after. And then the R host is the vulnerable system, right? So the vulnerable system is the one on the internet. Um, and, you know, dot 61 is the one that I want to flood. And so when I send this request, it's saying respond to 61 and it gets flooded, right? Um, and we do this for a lot of different modules, but this is the basic use case for all of the, 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 the Metasploit modules that I modified. Then we did a, a quick look on Shodan to just get some rough numbers in terms of recursion. So recursion is, um, uh, you know, just instead of uh, an NTP-based example, DNS-based example, tell me everything that your uh, name server knows about, even if you're not authoritative for it. So it basically spits back a list of everything, and here's the number of systems that are on the internet based on Shodan, which have this particular flaw. It's sort of a misconfiguration in the service, um, but again, it's really great for doing what we want here. So a lot of, a lot of systems in China um, you know, either uh, intentional or unintentional. Maybe they were, um, hey guys, wouldn't it be great if we had more DNS servers? Um, maybe not. 
So similar to the NTP-based example, um, DNS-based spoofing, and we just set the source IP to 61, and we set the number of requests. So you could, you know, you could change this to be you know, 100, 1,000, whatever you'd like, and maybe run it multiple times if you had multiple systems, and it would just run. Again, though, it does require the, um, the system to allow spoofing to basically forward on that traffic. So if it doesn't forward on the traffic, you're basically conforming to the best practice, um, the common best practice uh, 38. So that's sort of a limiting factor here, again, to keep in mind. So coming back to the, uh, to the charge end service, um, this is basically what it looks like. You have a system or the service that we're just connecting to. Again, we're using UDP and we're just sending an A and then the flood on the bottom is all the data back. And so, I mean, this is like, this is ideal, right? Um, again, why this stuff is running on the internet, I have no idea. Um, but we looked and showed in, and I think that there were near uh, 10,000 systems on Shodan, which had this. I was like, for what reason? I don't know. Um, so again, the, the charge in based uh, module. So we just load the charge in, um, and then we just set the R host flag and say run. And then the responses come back and we say, that's great. So this spoofing, similar to what we saw before, we set the source IP, and then just the number of requests uh, set it as one, and then we'll just get the response. In terms of the comparison, uh, just a quick TCP dump. So right on the right, this is the request. Um, on the left, the response, right? Really just um, you know, being able to demonstrate the, uh, the magnitude of the data that's coming back. And one last example was the uh, SSDP. Uh, this is just another service that we came into, and um, so this allowed spoofing as well, and uh, worked out. All right, so that's, that's reflection-based attacks, right? Where we're doing the spoofing of our source IP, um, sending it to a vulnerable system on the internet, and then it basically takes the response and sends it on to the person who we spoofed. Now we're gonna talk about, um, we're gonna go through specific direct access-based attack vectors. So what these are is, instead of using reflection, basically do any sort of spoofing, we're gonna just connect to our targets directly, or maybe we're gonna use Tor to basically go through Tor um, to do that type of connection. So the first uh, attack vector that we looked at was one that came out in 2009. Um, so this is a while ago from Rsnake. Um, and why this is even in the talk is because it's still useful today, right? You could set up an Ubuntu uh, 14 LTS system and bring it down with one command. And it's fast. It's fast and it doesn't require many resources, right? It just works. Um, so this is like, it's pretty ridiculous. It really focuses mostly on Apache and a few other web servers. Um, but if that's what you're going after, um, you know, it's quick. Why go with something, uh, you know, something else? It's, it's been out for a while. The documentation's pretty good. Um, and it's been tested. So this would probably be the way that I would go. Um, the cool thing here is that the bandwidth requirements are really, really small. So even if you don't have a really large pipe, you can still send and, you know, you can still have a lot of success. So it's a really great vector. And the way that it works is, in essence, it just keeps um, the connection header open, and it just doesn't shut it down. So it just, you know, it just sort of waits forever. It just sort of waits, 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 and then from there, you just, you know, you just keep it going. Um, so what we did was, for each of these attacks, we basically put together a pros and cons for them, so that it's sort of like a guide for, you know, if I were doing this DDoS-based test, here's a couple of things that you'd want to keep in mind. So first, Lodoris, it, you know, it's great because it still works against Apache even today. Um, the bandwidth uh, is really, really low in terms of resources, so that's great. Um, the cons, you know, it's not always gonna work if you have like a content distribution network in place um, and some of the features aren't fully tested. Um, but that's actually maybe even a good thing. You could jump in there, add some features. It has IP, IPv6 support, so that's pretty awesome. So. Um, there's a lot of different ways you could use this. Um, and Apache is very, very common, right? Um, so hash collisions. So hash collisions, this is a really interesting one. This is where we start getting actually, um, you know, some of the newer school-based attacks. Um, so hash collisions, in, in essence, it's when we're actually talking to a specific application, so like PHP, for example, and we're sending it content, and that content is going to map back to the same hash. Uh, and in essence, having the server do a ton of work. It's gonna have to look up all of these different values 
And in essence, they're going to map to the same thing. So it's just, you know, it's going to kill itself. The problem here is that it's very specific to the version of the language that you're targeting, right? So um, it, we can't just go and, you know, sort of, you know, assume, okay, if it's running Apache, we can just fire this off. We need to know what languages they're running. So it does require a little bit more understanding of the target. So we put together just the listing here to make it really, really simple. Um, so for Java, you're pretty much across the board. Um, for PHP, specific versions. Um, but I mean, it, it works on Python. It works pretty much everywhere. Um, the interesting thing here is that it actually, um, the initial disclosure for this particular vector was back in 2003 in Perl. So a long, long time ago, they actually knew about this and it sort of just came back to bite everybody else um, that hadn't mitigated the flaw. So that type of thing can happen a lot um, and we should be looking for other types of vulnerabilities that might have been fixed in one language that would affect others, right? So that's, that's definitely a good thing to keep in mind for developers. Um, so yeah, I mean, this is affecting pretty much across the board and pretty much in a really, really bad way um, because what in essence it does is it basically kills the memory of the system. So here's what it looks like. Um, and yeah, this, this box is totally not coming back, right? So if you're, if you're on SSH, you're not going to be able to use that system. You're going to literally need to be consoled in and, uh, and hope that you're, uh, you're also not running as root. Because uh, if the web server is running as root, bad things can definitely happen. So the pros and cons for the hash collisions based vector, right? So it, it affects a large number of languages, but many of them have patched this particular flaw. So if they're, um, so it, it can be a pro and a con. I think it's a pro. Um, because it has wide coverage um, if they haven't mitigated this particular, if they haven't running the latest versions. Um, it's a little bit harder to block than a bandwidth-based flood, which is really a pro for us as, as the attackers, um, maybe a con for the defenders, um, whatever, you know, side or, you know, hat you wear. Um, in essence, on the, on the con side, though, um, it requires a little bit more research, right? We have to understand the application a little bit better. We have to understand where it's going to hit the database. We have to understand where the application is going to process that request and how that's going to work, right? So if they're static pages, they're not actually using that content, then you know that URL of that particular page might not be useful. But if we hit the right page and we get this content to be processed, then we're absolutely going to uh, potentially cause this particular vector to, um, to execute. Um, lastly, it does require a bit more memory uh, on the attacker side, so we have to be able to generate all of these um, different hashes. Um, so that's it's just another thing to keep in mind. So when you're allocating systems, uh, which we're going to talk about later in the talk, we need to keep this in mind so that um, the resources wouldn't just be one guy in Starbucks with his laptop. He might spin up a few systems uh, additionally. Um, now, another vulnerability um, sort of in combination with DOS um, is one from uh, the THC uh, guys. They did some SSL-based DOS back in 2011. And so they put out this really cool tool. It's, it's in essence, it's, um, it, it uses the connections to a system when there is SSL to basically renegotiate that SSL connection. What this does is it basically forces the server to do a ton of work and the client's just making a quick request, right? It's really, 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 uh, intensive on the server, not on the client. And that's where DOS comes in. So we looked at the code, um, and it was a great tool, but it had a lot of limitations. One of the main limitations was there was arbitrary wait delays. Uh, in addition, it didn't support uh, lookups by hostname, so it would only use IPs, and it would do these arbitrary waits. This is not going to work for what we need. Um, so we removed all of that. And what we also added was the, the ability for it to do a renegotiation over TCP if it was disabled initially. So this is a really great combination where um, we, we had to go through their code, basically fix it up a little bit and clean it, um, and we're gonna be putting out this code so that you guys can take it and just, you know, if you run into uh, a system that might be vulnerable to this, um, you know, have at it, have a good time. So the THC DOS, uh, the recommendations, it still works three years later, which is really great. Um, it's highly effective um, against most configurations. Um, the downsides are that uh, if you're running content distribution networks, it probably won't work. Um, but that's really the only downside. Um, 
you'd be able to look for the number of requests, you know, in terms of the renegotiations that are being made. And then if you see this number of IPs, you could just block them that way. So there's, you know, there are some easy ways to block people, but if they don't have any of those controls in place, you're probably going to win. Uh, the next vulnerability here that we used, um, this was a, a, an interesting logic, um, I'm calling it a, a logic K-line, you know, where the system basically just dies. Um, in essence, it was an application which did require authentication, right? So I had to communicate with the system, had to authenticate, get in, um, which you might not always have. Um, but what it had um, was a unique session identifier, uh, which we could regenerate from the attacker's side. So this did require a bit more uh, knowledge of the application. And this is the actual uh, communications that we were making. So we see in the cookie value right over here uh, is that we can basically fuzz this particular parameter. And what we were looking for at the time was not actually a DOS, but we ran into a DOS condition during the test. And so this was something that was um, you know, identified during our fuzzing session. And when you identify something like this, it's important to go back and say, wait, we found an interesting condition here that might not be you know, a traditional based um, you know, cross-site scripting, SQL injection, this type of thing. It could be something else and really just go back and try to reproduce it to see if we could get something useful out of it, right? To get a DOS condition that was highly effective and wow, was it effective. This particular flaw in combination with the misconfiguration on the web server where they were running it as root, which is not exactly like we'd be able to still get the same vulnerability out of it. Um, it wouldn't have the same impact. If it's running as root, it's going to be much worse. What happened is we were able to send about, you know, 100 or so requests. And in essence, the server basically died. And when I say died, it basically was not accessible via SSH or console, right? It looks like this. It's dead to the max. Um, and it was reproducible as well. So um, you could literally say, you know, three, two, one, and it's down, right? So low bandwidth, extremely low bandwidth, did require auth, but if you found this condition in the right server, it's dead, right? And CDNs aren't going to block this, WAFs aren't going to block this, you're going to get by scot-free, no problem. Uh, so it's important to look for even these types of conditions um, and, be, you know, obviously be cautious in terms of, you know, you don't want to bring anything down and, you know, but keep in mind that if you did, is it reproducible? That's really the question, right? So to go back, um, if you ever ran into a WAF or uh, you know, something that was supposed to block this, um, try to figure out, could I just bypass it using just quotes or comments or something like that? Uh, really effective technique here. So again, with the limited resources, right? I could run into a CDN, I could run into a WAF, I could run into an IPS, they're not going to be blocking this particular type of uh, logic because it's supposed to work this way. I'm not sending malicious requests. I'm sending the same requests that I should be making. And I'm not saying a lot of them, and I can wait a long time. Or I could send it from multiple systems if they were allowing me to log in from different sites. Right? So if they weren't restricting me to a single login per user, which is a common vulnerability in a lot of web applications, we could do this from a lot of different sites all at the same time. Right? Uh, and, and that would just, yeah, highly effective. Um, so in terms of your bypasses, you're pretty much, you need to fix your web app because um, your controls to mitigate this flaw, they're not, gonna, they're not gonna work. You need to fix the code and you know, fix the, obviously, the running as root, that's just bad. But even if it wasn't running as root, it probably still would have been. <laughs> oh my God. Cheers. <laughs> wow. Thank you, guys. Did not see that coming. So nobody in here told me about that. Anyways. Ah, good times. Anyways, um, so the cons, right? It's very this this particular bug, very language specific, right? And it, not just that, it was application specific. But if you found a similar vulnerability in any app or any framework or any anything, 
please talk about it because this is the type of bug that like people die for. Like this is great. Like if I would have heard somebody tell me that you could bring an app to its knees in like a few hundred requests and it's reproducible, that's like that's gold. <laughs> um, so if you know, uh, for sure talk about it. Um, it required auth. It required you know some access. Uh, it didn't require source code, but it did require auth. So it's just something to keep in mind. I'm just still. Anyways, it was good, it was good. All right, so what we did was we basically took all of these different attack vectors, right, and you know, we didn't really cover HPing3 because I figure you guys already know it and you can look it up and there are plenty of other attacks. But what we did here was we really just put together a menu for anyone who's gonna do a DOS and you basically tell me, you know, what are the knobs we can, you know, change, right? Do you have a lot of bandwidth, right? Or could you use those vulnerable systems on the internet? Right? And if you can't do that, well, maybe we disregard a couple of the attacks. Um, can you do recon? Yes, no. Uh, do you have auth? We disregard that, that vulnerability. But if you have some flexibility here, um, you can expand or focus your efforts on certain types of vectors. Um, if you can get source code to the application, you know, there's tons of other things that might expand there, right? There's, you know, this particular attack pattern uh, would change, right? What comes into play? How do we do this different types of testing? Um, and there's plenty of other vectors, right? There's plenty of other tools. I didn't, this is no means a comprehensive list. This is where you'd basically start. This co gives good coverage on a lot of tools that we've seen be highly successful in DDoS-based testing, testing for clients who are really concerned about, can you bring my web application down? What would it take? How much effort? How much resources? It helps answer those questions. All right. So all of the stuff that we've talked about so far has been either direct or the reflective-based attacks. How do we make this stuff distributed? How do we really take larger scale, I want a botnet behind me, not just my laptop, maybe a, you know, and a whatever. All right, so what, what do we need to do? We need to basically take all of this stuff that we're doing, we need to spin up either cloud instances or systems in our data center and basically give our attacks scale. That's in essence where we wanna be. Um, so what we did was we, we put together uh, some tools to do this, and that's what we're going to be talking about now. So the first thing that we looked at was our, our different options in, in things like uh, EC2 or Rackspace based cloud, right? These guys, that's what they do. They have the ability to basically spin up as much computational resources. Uh, we want a piece of the pie, right? We want to be able to do, you know, 1,000, 2,000, 5,000, 10,000 systems. And, you know, in theory, they can do this. There are a lot of limitations here, right? We need to be able to do this type of test, push out that bandwidth, um, and we need to be authorized to do so, right? And their security teams would probably need to be in the loop on that, right? If you just spin these up and you just start launching, uh, they're probably gonna just shut you down. So what we've found has been really successful is talking, building the relationship with your team and theirs. Uh, if you wanted to use cloud-based services, they, they definitely need to be in the know. And from there, you know, as you work with them, um, you know, things get a little bit easier. So this is um, this one tool uh, that was released, and this is, again, this is already online, so you guys can take it and run with it. Um, the guys over at Rackspace, we found, were really, really good and really, really helpful in when we actually wanted to go out and do a DOS. So there's one command here which would, in essence, allow you to spin up, you know, you know, 100, 1,000 systems, really, really easy. Um, and specific to Rackspace, we're just including a, uh, an identifier for the Ubuntu LTS uh, 12 system, right, which is a pretty common based Ubuntu uh, server where you could just install all, all of your attack tools on there and then from there uh, launch the attack. Again, you do need to get authorization to do this um, because you need to basically map out, all right, how many systems do you want? When do you want to launch the attack? So there's a lot of a lot of paperwork that needs to go on behind the hood, but once you get all that stuff out of the way, repeating it for a lot of different clients is really easy. Um, so in addition to that, we wanted to basically cover, um, here's the, basically the, uh, the rough metrics in terms of um, your capabilities, right? Um, if you wanted, say, um, you know, just a large number of systems, right, you probably wanna go as small as you can, you can go, right? If you want the fastest one system, um, you know, you go down to the bottom, right? In terms of what we found to be successful, 
Um, maybe going for not the smallest or the largest, going somewhere in the middle, you get the most bang for the buck in terms of resources uh, and being able to push out the most um, you know, with, with what you have, right? It, you're not gonna go the fastest uh, as compared to one particular node, um, but the bandwidth comparisons from a price perspective as well makes sense. So I'd probably go with you know, maybe 2,000 or so um, you know, flavor four instances over more uh, of the three or the eight, right? Um, just depending, you know, I found that those were pretty good. Um, maybe you go fives, um, but fours were pretty good. Um, and most tools wouldn't require more than that amount of memory, right? The, uh, the use case here in terms of the bandwidth is, is definitely something you're gonna keep in mind. And how we conduct the test, is it gonna be direct to the client or are we gonna go through an additional layer like Tor? And if so, are we running those end nodes? We'll talk about that. So we have, uh, at this point, we have the capability to spin up um, the 1,000 or 5,000 or whatever um, scale system by just using a simple command here. And we've decided what we wanna use, right? So from there, it's really just pushing out and running our particular commands in uh, all of these different systems. So how do we do that? So the first thing that we wanted to do um, was to be able to do this in a really repeatable way. Um, so what we did was we basically created an SSH key, pushed it to all of these systems, and we just used that to basically you know, spawn out all of these commands. So we just add a quick item to our uh, SSH config, and from there you can basically run commands on all the boxes and you know, it's not gonna complain about host checks or anything like that. So that, that's exactly what we wanted. Um, next, the uh, distributed command. This is what would run a, you know, like the ID command on all the boxes. So this is something that we're going to be releasing uh, fairly soon. It's going to be uh, on our website. And in essence, what it allows you to do is you give it a list of IPs and a command run, and it runs it on all the boxes. And you can either get the output or redirect it to dev null or whatever you'd like. So if we run a run, uh, the example on the bottom, the dos.perl command on Acme Co, we just send the lists dot text file and it will basically just run everything on all those systems. And again, this basically assumes you can SSH these boxes without typing in a passphrase or something like that. It's all SSH keys on, under the hood. And the way that this works is it actually uses the PDSH utility and which is basically just a distributed um, parallel uh, SSH uh, client. And we just wrote a wrapper in Perl to basically make it a little bit easier for people. I think that that's pretty easy like this, rather than actually having to go in through PDSH and all that stuff. Um, so hopefully you guys like it too. So this is the capability to run one command on multiple systems. What about the capability to do multiple times? Well, um, a multi-command would do that too. And this is something that we're also in including in our toolkit. So the multi-command, um, we just give it the command we want to run, the number of times, and if we want to run it in a loop or not, just zero or one. Really, really simple. Uh, so from there, we get a flood on Acme Co. run 20 times from one box. And if we ran this in a distributed manner, on all boxes, right? Really, really easy. What about stealth? How does that work? Well, we have really have a couple options here, right? We can use end nodes or, you know, sort of the Tor exit nodes that are already existing, or we could spin up our own Tor exit node, right? This is really a question for your team and how and, you know, what the client basically would accept. If they're cool with you just using Tor exit nodes on the internet, then that's good enough. We'll just do that. Um, if they really want it to be all your systems and they're still gonna basically uh, block your IPs, then you know that's something to just keep in, keep in mind. Uh, the proxy chains NG uh, project, this is here at the bottom. This was actually really, really useful because what it allowed you to do was to specify a specific configuration for the instances of Tor that you're gonna run on. Why is that useful? Because what you can do is you can spin up 10 instances or 100 instances or whatever number of instances of Tor you want and generate configs for what you want to test. And then have it run any command over all of those instances of Tor. So here's what it looks like. So we wanna spin up 10 instances of Tor. We say Tor uh, or the multi-Tor .sh 10 instances, and this is gonna create a configuration for, file for you. So the proxy change config, and we're good. So from there, uh, with that, you can say run all, and it would basically push 
this hash table, uh, which is the hash collision based attack to all of the instances on one node on all your 10 instances of Tor. So with that, again, your Tor, your Tor client is gonna be connecting to the different um, Tor exit nodes in theory. Uh, and that would give you new IP addresses if you were using systems on the internet or if you're using your own, it would just use the single end exit node that you're using. So if you're using systems on the internet, you'd basically be able to mask your IP address and they wouldn't be able to keep up with blocking each IP because it's gonna be changing frequently and you're gonna be spinning up and spinning down those Tor clients. So that's really, really effective um, and would work really well in a distributed manner. And this sort of puts it all together, right? This really just uh, makes it really, really easy. So with that, um, one of the things that we haven't yet talked about, which is almost the most important piece, is how do we validate when we actually have a success, right? Is an Nmap scan sufficient to basic, basically be able to say, this website's down, um, or is that maybe not enough? What we found in testing is we need to make sure the service is obviously up, but we also need to log in. We need to interact with the database. We need to make sure the website works. We need to make sure the application works as a normal user would expect it to. If I can't get the content that I'm looking for, I don't care if your website is up. It doesn't matter to me. I need to be able to use it like a normal user would. So we use a tool called HTTP. And with this, what we can do is we just give it um, the location, the URL, and it works just like ping, right? It gives us you know, all the response times, the errors, all the messages, everything we need. Um, so obviously the website's working, right? Because we can get the page, get the content. Well, uh, Apple's website wasn't working when they uh, were doing their launch. Um, you know, Nmap said it was up, but uh, you look at the site and it's not what a normal user would expect, right? And even with Akamai in front of it, uh, this is not acceptable for a normal user experience, right? It's the content, it's the usability of the site, which is what the user cares about, and with that, what the client would care about, right? So their website's down even though it's up, right? It doesn't work this way. So what do we need to do to get better, right? There's a lot of things on my list. Um, for everybody uh, who's a pen tester, uh, hopefully you can take this presentation and all the resources that we're gonna release and go through all of that. Uh, we're also gonna release a pen testing uh, DDoS checklist. Here are the things to make sure you're gonna get covered when you do a DDoS-based assessment um, to basically ensure coverage and depth for any uh, security assessment. And this is something we wanna start a dialogue with you guys. Um, so if you have feedback, questions, things to make it better, let's start a dialogue on that uh, and you guys can absolutely provide insight uh, and ways to make this better. For all the developers, we need to stress test everything, right? We need to really go back to what does it mean to build an application and really bang on every single input in you know, unintended ways, in addition to the intended ways. Could your site handle 100 users, 1,000 users, 10,000 users? You know, what, what are the limitations? And understanding where this thing scales and where it doesn't, right? Understand your application better than anybody, but also the things you didn't even think about. Um, I found that a, a lot of universities, they don't really stress stress testing, right? This is something that I didn't see when I was at university. Um, I'd like to see more universities do that, push that back to the developers, um, and then, you know, later scale, we can uh, also educate them about a lot of the security vulns. Um, response teams, uh, they definitely need to be in the loop on a lot of this testing, um, so that would be great. Um, when we do testing, we'll basically go and say, hey, you know, are you guys seeing the type of traffic that we're expecting um, or are you seeing something completely different? Did you see when I'm spoofing these different IP addresses or did you see when I'm launching Slolores from this particular system or you completely not even have that insight, that, that visibility? Um, so working with teams in a more white box scenario um, when appropriate before you get to the more sophisticated with black box because uh, maybe that's the best bang for the buck. Um, there's a lot of other things that we could cover here um, but I did want to be able to uh, take questions from you guys. So uh, let's sort of open this up for questions. Question. Yes. Um, 
So for those particular tests, you do need to be mindful about the fact that um, you know, you're not going to be like flooding the pipes, right? You're clearly going to be going for the application layer based attacks. Um, we found that we were able to not have any issue with, you know, speed performance um, based on what we were trying to achieve using Tor, right? For, for the specific attacks where we used Tor, um, didn't have an issue with the performance because we basically understood um, the menu or the attack menu here um, and mapped it back to what would be relevant for that particular limitation because we were very much aware of it. Any other questions? All righty. Um, so we're going to be releasing all of the resources for this presentation on our website. So if you go to praetorian.com forward slash DDoS forward slash tools, uh, it'll be there. And in addition, um, if anybody, you guys are, uh, you know, do pen testing, you know, if you guys are looking for jobs, let me know. Uh, we're hiring and uh, I'm going to be here for the next couple of days. So uh, yeah, with that, if you guys uh, have any other questions, uh, we're pretty much, we're good. So thank you.